Hello, hello viewers, you're watching Off Track. Hello and welcome to Off Track. I'm your host, Dave Neal, and welcome to Squadcast. This is a new venture and a new way of recording a podcast. Whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. Um, but who better to try it out with than our old friend, World Superbike commentator from Eurosport, Greg Haynes. Greg, welcome to the show, mate. AKA the guinea pig. Thank you very much, Dave. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, mate. I'm good. I'm good. I think we're just about ready for Christmas on the on the ready wind down for it and uh, shaking the season off. And uh, what about you over in sunny Spain? How's things? Yeah, this is going out before Christmas, isn't it? Absolutely, it is. Not like last so we, year. So we don't have to talk about, I oh, remember back in December or anything like that. No, I'm okay, thank you. Yeah, the <laughs> weather, I'm looking out the window, it's dry. We had a lot of rain here the last few days. Um, but it's not cold. I went outside quite late last night, relatively mild, and no, it's nice. But I'm looking at all the news reports in the UK. It looks absolutely bloody freezing over there, literally. And oh, I'm back there, I'm back there this weekend. Mornings. Yeah. It's you are indeed, this. yeah. You're flying back again this weekend. It, fingers crossed there's no flight trouble. I think we'll be okay. To no, it's, them, but, it gets um, milder at the weekend, Greg. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't think... Do you think we'll get a white Christmas? Who knows? I'm not sure. I don't know, Greg. I don't know. Mm. I thought you are going to give us a couple of bars then. You're going to give us a couple of bars of White Christmas there, Greg. I thought you were going to start breaking into song. I've been dreaming of one, Dave. Oh, excellent. Just like the ones we used to know, eh? Exactly, just like those. <laughs> maybe, we can have a bit of a, maybe we can have a bit of a sing song later in the show. I want to, I want to, I want to increase the <laughs> listenership, not kill it. <laughs> Therefore, we should have a song voice. later in the show. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, Greg, see, what a world superbike season. Yeah. It's been... It, it, when you actually think back, because it's all gone in a blur, it wasn't all squished together, was it, like it was in 2021? It was a half sort of transitional year, wasn't it? Back from a COVID year to a normal year, which means we've got the shortest off-season ever with a late finish and the February start, which is great. Um, but yes, what an incredible season. I don't know whether it was as good as 21 in the sense that it didn't go down to the last round as it did with Toprak and Jonathan Ray last year. But even so, the level is higher than it's ever been. I think 23 is going to be even better. They're testing as we record this, aren't they? Remy Gardner, Domi Agata and people are over in Jerez. Ah, um, oh, it's just been incredible. And we've had a third different rider on a third different bike for the third year in a row winning the World Championship. And how good was it as well to see Ducati back on top? Oh, it was fantastic. And I, it's it's what Alvaro should have done back in mm -hmm. 19. It was, yeah, 19. And it showed the potential then of what he could do on, on the Ducati. But then to actually come out and do it, and you kind of always had that thing of like, at what point is his head going to fall off? And it didn't. He put together yeah. a really strong season in the face of probably some more intense competition because it wasn't just Jonathan taking it to him. Scott was there on occasion, but of course it was Toprak on the Yamaha as well. And Toprak on his day, again, Donington, well, on his days with races on Saturdays and Sundays now, obviously, but Donington did the treble. Indonesia, Indonesia, he was on pole position by one second, a full second at world championship level. That's unheard of now. Unbelievable. You've got to sort of go back to the Agostini days or maybe the Rossi days or something like that. But um, I think the right man, in fact, I'm convinced, Dave, and I've talked to quite a lot of people about this over the last few weeks. I am convinced that the best rider team bike package won the World Championship this season. I personally don't feel Yamaha or Kawasaki can be 100% pleased with their 2022. Even if you took Batista out of the equation, they had too many problems. Yamaha are going back and forth with new and old electronics packages. The Kawasaki's not quick enough in a straight line. And they had a few issues as well. And of course, they ran into each other a couple of times, which definitely didn't help. And that really changed the complexion of the season if you look back with the way the points gap opened up. But also, Ducati improved big time, didn't they? OK, he had a crash at Donington, but they were miles off at Donington last year and previous years. This year, right there, they made big, big progress. And surely, Bautista's got to be favoured again heading into 23 well we'll see well you'd like to think so but and that was the, the 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 turning point for me was Donington because you thought how much of a a difficult time Bautista's yeah. had there before when he crashed in the rain going up through yeah. um Schwantz's curb yeah and you thought well if he gets through this weekend with a decent points level 
you kind of know he's going to be okay because we know that Yamaha is really good around Donington. We know Johnny Ray knows his way around there particularly yeah. well. Um, it was great to be there and to, and to see Toprak do his first treble. That that was something a little bit special. There's been a, mm. a year of special moments just for me as a fan. Um, but to to be there for that was 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 pretty yeah. cool. And he just looked unstoppable. Yeah, he did. And he, he really got back to his best, hadn't he, at that point? Because earlier on in the season, you know, we were all thinking and we knew it was very likely he was going to be going to MotoGP next year. Of course, it didn't happen in the end for all the reasons we know with Yamaha's teams in MotoGP. But it was going to happen. And Top Rat was fitting the press. You had the number one plate on a Yamaha, which had never been seen before in World Superbikes, and the MotoGP talk and the problems we said before with the electronics. And he has admitted it did get to him. They had a problem at Mizano, as if you remember, with a breakdown. And I think it was race one on the Saturday. So they lost quite a lot of points. He obviously had the coming together with Ray at Assen as well, which took them both down. And Bautista scored 25 points. So if you look back at all these things, that's a heck of a lot of points that Top Rack lost. Top Rack could have won the World Championship this year. He could have done it two years in a row. But they were just lacking in that consistency, weren't they? Like you said, Dave. Donington was a big turning point. For me, Barcelona was a massive turning point too when Batista just dominated and he made everyone else look silly there. Yes, he's got an incredible straight line speed advantage, but I really don't believe it's just that. It's his corner exits. Um, it is it's his aero. It's the, the improvements with electronics and the way he's working the bike and the way things have moved on. Apparently as well, you know, I heard from somebody fairly recently, that he focuses all his fitness training on a very complete body training and the way he gets himself down on the bike and all that sort of thing. Somebody who probably should remain nameless from Ducati said to me, Scott Redding is focusing too much on cycling and all his, all his uh, muscles in the wrong places for riding a motorcycle. Don't shoot the messenger. Now, obviously, this is a Ducati person and there's no love loss there. But it was quite an interesting thought. Um, and who's to say it's not true? I mean, they're saying Batista focuses on his core strength and can throw because he does have a disadvantage in throwing the bike around, doesn't he? In the corners as a lighter and smaller rider. So I, I just think Ducati Batista and for that feel racing Aruba team did a better job than the others. It's as simple or as complicated me, as let... you like. No, it is. It, it wasn't mm. just simply man child on a missile, was it? Mm, mm. Um, there's I'll just counter slightly on that cycling side of it and i understand go. that yeah. completely because uh, whether it's your true quads i don't know and your glutes your quads and your glutes are the heaviest muscles in the body and right people can quite happily write in and correct me on that but I, that's what i believe Sounds about right that your quads your quads and your glutes are the and cyclists have them in abundance yeah Brad ray won the british superbike championship that's and he's point. another very <laughs> very keen cyclist yeah that is it a good point it didn't, it didn't hurt brad True. I'm just trying to think. Is just, there as a, anything... just as a counter. No, 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 it's a good point. It's a good point. It just goes to show, obviously, this person at Ducati, like I said before, there's no love loss there. And is it a case of sour grapes? Or is it because the circuits are so different in BSB and they don't have the the aids on the bikes? Or is it a bit of all this? Uh, yeah, good point, though. Good point. Touche. Yeah, but, I'm not, um... certainly not saying it's not because the bikes are, are very, very different in terms of electronic yeah. aids, as you say. So, yeah, it's it's a bit. Yeah, th there's all sorts of different um, different whys and wherefores. And do you mind if I don't? Yeah, I I think it's a bit of all, everything we've said. You know, it's probably not. Of course, it's not all to do with the cycling thing, is it? And it's not all to do with straight line <laughs> speed advantage. But I just don't. Is there some sour grapes from the other riders? Yes, because they all wish they had that straight line speed advantage. Do they have a point in some areas? Yes. I think there should be a minimum combined weight, don't you, of rider and bike. But I also think there needs to be some sort of percentage threshold there. So it's not putting too much weight on a smaller rider. If you speak with Taron McKenzie, Neil McKenzie from their 125 days, remember all the trouble they had there in trying not to put too much weight on a smaller rider because that's dangerous. So it is. I think, to be fair, everyone's selfish. Everyone wants to win in the, in the nicest possible way. Um, and they've all got a point, probably. But I do think the balance... I still think Ducati and Bautista did a better job over the season. 
I really do. Yeah, I, I, you can't agree with that. The the, the table mm. doesn't tell lies, does it? That's the yeah. thing. And he he was his consistency was was pretty incredible. Yes. Um, on on the, it just the planets aligned for him nicely. He didn't get caught up in the Johnny and Top Rack issues. No. Um, they they cost themselves points, whereas Bautista was yeah. out and ahead of it, um, and didn't yeah. need to get involved. And he true. can battle, but he is he's quite a his leverage isn't quite on the same uh, level as Johnny and Toprak to be able to to yeah. scrap on the the slightly bigger bike. So once he's out front, that's it. He's done. He just defends his. He just he races his sector times, and that's it. And, and he did it. He did it brilliantly, didn't he? In the same way Jonathan Ray did when he had the best bike in the field. And by the way, not taking anything away from Jonathan Ray at the time or Batista this year, because they've contributed to make those bikes the best bikes on the grid or the best package. Batista's still saying it's not the best bike on the grid. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I agree with that because if the Ducati wasn't the best bike, which was, um, okay, the Yamaha maybe. It's certainly not the Kawasaki anymore, is it? Not at the moment, anyway. No. But yeah, I don't know. There's it made for some interesting talking points, that's for sure. But I do, yeah, I still stick by what I said. And this isn't just me saying it as an opinion. It's based on talking with different people. I still do think the best, the right man won this year. Although um, the others were close. If you look back at the stats, they're not too far away, really. Um, A considered opinion, Greg. I like it. <laughs> the weight thing's an interesting one, though. I think it's going to come in, but I think it'll come in for 24 and I wouldn't be surprised if Baptista is then retired, which will be a bit ironic if he comes in for the first year since he's off the grid. But I think another thing, just to throw in there, Dave, before we move on from the weight thing, yeah. I think it's really important that we all remember as well, this is not just a riders' championship. It's a team, a manufacturer's championship as well. So if they are going to complain about differences in top speeds and acceleration and torque curves and all the rest of it, well, then the only way you can equal that is by having everybody on the same bike. And that's... You know, if you want that, you can watch the Rookies Cup or the British Talent Cup or, or whatever. It is a manufacturer's championship as well, isn't it? And if you do start equaling things is. or penalising people for doing well, the manufacturers are going to say bye-bye anyway, aren't they? So you don't want That's that. That's the thing I never really understood about British touring cars and things like that. You got penalised weight, sort of the weight of a passenger or something like that. I kind of like mm. success ballast. Kind yeah. Of is not like an oxymoron or something because it's almost a, it, it's penalizing you for being successful um yeah but you as you rightly say about about taron and, and neil and taron was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago um when he first started in the 125s he was 35 kilos which is about my left leg and you know <laughs> to try and get him up to a certain weight but you didn't notice Scott complaining when he was on the Ducati and was a lot, he was further yeah. up the field on the Ducati than he has been on the BM because BM obviously is still in development and they're making some fair strides with it. But Scott was challenging for the championship and race wins and the podium nearly every weekend, no? Yes, he was. That is very true. Although, and, and that's why I do think. I went all uh, Alvaro Bautista then. You know, I went but... all Alvaro Bautista. Is that <laughs> but... all right now? But, he, yeah, he had to put an apology out as well, didn't he? Because if he said, if it's all about a light rider winning, why didn't Danny Pedrosa ever win the championship? And it, he didn't mean, it came across a bit, ooh, he didn't mean it like that. And you know exactly what he means. Uh, but, of course, there's no love lost between Reading and Bautista because they were Grassini Honda teammates. And that, it goes right back, doesn't it? Um, the guy with Fondo. Fair, uh, exactly. Yeah, well, certainly go. I don't know if it was much fun. <laughs> but, <Pretty much. laughs> that's right, it's good. we've got the camera. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Yeah, but I can't remember what I was going to say, Dave. It's gone. It was something about... Oh, Greg. Yeah, it wasn't... I was going to say there's no love lost between the two of them, but also... Ah, yes. It's come back 10 ah. minutes later. No, I was going to say Scott Redding, in fairness, did... I did an interview with him at pre-season testing about two years ago. So he was a Ducati rider. And to be fair to Scott... He did bring it up then as well. He still thought it wasn't completely fair. And his main argument was Formula One's got a combined minimum driver car limit. So and they don't even have a bearing on the, the centre of gravity of the vehicle as a rider does on a bike. So why don't we have one? Motor 2, Motor 3, Super Sport and Super Sport 300 all have this. 
MotoGP does not. Even Valentino Rossi mentioned this. Um, well, Superbike does not. So I think you need a window in the middle. You need a minimum, a minimum combined rider bike weight limit, but a maximum as well. And then it will give you that sort of 10, 12 kilogram threshold in the middle. There's always going to be somebody who's so small and light, you're not going to be up to the minimum weight. And there's always going to be somebody like a Camia or a Baz who's taller and heavier, and you're not going to get them under. But, you know, it's a, what about horse racing? What about bat? if you're a small... I've chatted with Nico Sartori about this, who was working with Joe Roberts this year, and he's worked as a crew chief in Super Sport and Super Sport 300. He said, you know, what happens if you're a short person and you want to be a basketball star? What do you do? Lower the net for everybody. So we've got to just accept. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you can't you've have got, it you've got to accept. You've got to accept physiology. Yeah. You can't, you, it's, you're either you know, tall I, or you, 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 you're you born with what you've got. It's as simple yeah. as that. And yeah. All these guys can pedal a bike round. Exactly. That's why they are where they are. They're all and how incredible do you, And how races. do you judge rider talent in this as well? Or if there might be, you know, you might be having a bad day or a particularly good day. You can't gauge that, can you? So... No, in it some is, bikes, it, as we know, suit different tracks. So there's no, there's never yeah. a constant. And tyres are it's changing, not, and the weather conditions are changing. I mean, there's, exactly, there's no constant. And I think the I'm only probably... way you would that 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 could be that that could be applied is if it was the same bike on the same exactly. track at exactly. the same time of year, and you yeah. dismiss all the variables. Yeah. So yes, it's a point to be had. But there are so many other variables in, you know, when it rains, that levels the playing field a bit. Yeah. And you could it, also... That negates other things. Yeah. And if you really wanted to do it equally, as Nico Sartori said again, you'd have to break it down into different classes like they're doing boxing. You know, why does a heavyweight not fight a featherweight for obvious reasons? Why shouldn't they? But if you really wanted to do it, you could break it down into small and light riders. And then you've got to work out... And it's not going to happen, is it? So we're going to have to just accept that um, there are just deal with it. Yeah, and I've probably bored everyone for more than long enough about those weight limits. But, <laughs> but it has been a, a hot topic this year, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it has, it has, and we could go with this. But there's, there's no, and this is the, sort of the last point on it that there is no definitive answer because there are so many variables. It's, yeah. Yes, it's an idea, but how you do it, where you put the weight, how you yeah. distribute it, how it penalizes, what advantages does it give anybody else? That there's there's a lot of um, a lot of work for Greg Levere and Scott Smart to do on on that side of things if they if as and when they do bring it in because yeah. having Alvaro Bautista go round in a suit of armor probably isn't the right way to to do it. <laughs> yeah, I think the key thing is they don't penalize the guys doing well. Boost the uh, those who are struggling. Give Honda and BMW a boost as they are, just like they've done Motor GP in previous years. Extra testing or a softer tire or whatever they did with open bikes, and now with the, the you know the lower teams get some advantages, don't they? But do not penalise the ones who are doing well because otherwise, what Correct. incentive is there for a manufacturer to invest millions of euros if they know they're going to just get pegged back? That's no good. And that kind of did happen no. a few years ago with Kawasaki, didn't it? To be fair to Kawasaki. Yeah. Here, have another 500 revs. Yeah, yeah. But that's and usually at the top end. That doesn't help the bottom end acceleration where they really... There was that too. But it was a bit unfair in the sense that they were being pegged back for doing well and then reverse grids were brought in. All that was to try and stop Ray and Kawasaki. In the same way, similar things were done in Formula 1 when Ferrari and Schumacher were dominating. But yeah, help the teams further back. That'll kick off as well eventually, I'm sure. If Honda start doing well, the BMW start rising. doing well. Yeah, but it does, yes. The team yes. always rises to the top. Especially Doesn't over a 36 race riding. season. Yeah, very true. And over a 36 race season, which is a long old year, you know, we only had three winners this year, and it was three incredible riders on brilliant bikes. I don't think it really took too much away from the show, but it just shows how high the level is, isn't it? So, yeah, good luck to the rest of them. Good luck to the rest of them. And that... That's that's been the thing. It's up to everybody else to almost catch up, isn't it? Mm, what was your yeah. y y the favourite point in commentary for the season, Greg? Favourite point in commentary, which is not necessarily my favourite moment of the year. It's probably the funny moments no, with Tozen. Because so, that's the next question. Oh, that's the next question. I think favourite point <laughs> in commentary is um, the first thing that's coming to my head. If you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably give you another answer. But the first thing is... <laughs> Well, it's, well, it's Tozen. He's just—he's got such a dirty mind, that man. Honestly, 
I was um, I was eating some wine gums during a red flag stoppage at Donington Park in the Super Sport race, which you kindly <laughs> bought for me, funnily enough. And um, I just said to him, "Do you like wine gums, James?" And he he had to, he can explain. You can ask him on a podcast of his own. He thought that was funny because he said it went back to school school day. And then there's another one at Phillip Island when they'd they'd pitted and changed tyres in race one. And Hafiz Shirin, who was one of the first to go out on slick tyres on a damp, drying track. And um, the TV director rightly cut to him to see how he was getting on. And he was just coming over the top of Lukey Heights and down into the turn 10 at MG. And he had a big moment like that. And the back tried to come round on the slicks. And I went, whoa, it's damp down there. And I just carried on talking. And Tozer was just in hysterical laughter. If you actually watch it back, you can hear him laughing. It's, it's just that, right? <laughs> so those are the funniest moments for me. I mean, why that should be funny, Tozer, Brilliant. I do not know. Um, oh, I yeah. don't know. But I yeah, remember, I remember like the, the, the wine gums. I certainly remember the wine gums story. We had that conversation on the, uh, the Sunday night before yes. we left Donington. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I, weirdly, I knew exactly where he was going to go with it. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's an age specific thing. It's an age specific thing. It's a northern, northern age specific thing. Exactly. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And as a much younger and Midlander, a Midlandy guy, I wouldn't know what you're talking about. It's outrageous. But you've got. Te, Tozland's 10 years older than you, isn't he? He certainly yeah. is. He certainly is. Back of the net. Um, yes, he is. <laughs> and I was James was born in nineteen. Let's go eighty. Yeah, I think, and I'm eighty nine. So yeah, he's nearly a full decade older than Incredible. me, which I like to remind him. It's been good there with James. Eighty nine, the the year I left school. Thanks, Greg. Was it really? <laughs> Lisa Lisa Stansfield was number one with All Around the World, apparently, when I was born. The end of October. Oh, is that the way? Oh, that's fair. Yeah. What was? Um, I think it was Amazing Grace, the the Scots band, uh, the, the pipes Royal and drums of the Scottish Highlands, Royal Scots yeah. Highlanders, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, the um, yeah, that, that was pipes. mine. <laughs> that so, was a long time so before, though. In three and a three and a half weeks, something like that. Three weeks and two days, I'll be fifty. Yeah, that you told <laughs> me that the other day. That is uh, that is incredible stuff. It's um, quite remarkable. Because looking at you, Dave... And scary. And weird. Yeah, that is and... scary. Yeah, that is scary. How do you feel? How does it feel? Because I think you feel I, like that you know at 30, what? 40, know. 50. Mm. You can tell us in January. 30 and, 30 and 40 were, were dead easy. 50 is just a little bit like, hmm. But you don't look... I'm, I'm a... You don't look... Careful. ...any older than 49, so... <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> anyway, so, moving so, on from so, that. I, I, yes, I, yeah, sorry. If abso- anyone's absolutely not dwelling on the fact that I've got a large birthday coming up. Um, yes. What was the best race this year, in your humble opinion? There's a few. In, in the World Superbike class. The race I actually enjoyed commentating on most and enjoyed as a race um, might not be an obvious one. It was the sprint race in Australia when the track was drying. Because I think we called it right as well, which we don't always do. We try to. But more than that, I just enjoyed the changing situation and Batista starting on slicks. James spotted he was on slicks on the warm-up lap. Um, So I remember saying, just as the race started, that he's going to go backwards, which he did. And then I just really enjoyed watching his progress on the timing screen. And they were showing him coming through. And there was just so much happening. And the pit stop race on the Saturday was good. But I do think, yeah, that Bautista sprint race was special, wasn't it? It was a ballsy thing to do. He had less to lose than everybody else as well. But again, that was his experience coming through. He knows Philip Island at that time of the year, of course, for most of GP. But also, history has shown that Grand Prix riders do not like intermediate tyres. And it wasn't a full no. wet situation. So he was. it was worth going for the slicks for him. Because the GP riders hate inters because they don't use them, do they, in MotoGP? So no. in a way, it was a bit of a no-brainer for him. So was it as as incredible a gamble as everybody thought? Yeah, it was, I guess, to go on slicks on that track. But I, he wouldn't have gone on inters. But I enjoyed that race. But calculated. Uh, yeah. Calculated gamble. Yeah, it was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, it was a great... He knew how dry, how quickly the track was going to dry. 
Um, and Toprak and Murray, I think, had to shadow each other because they were fighting still for second in the championship. But no, I enjoyed that race. Um, I enjoyed Super Sport, the very first race of the year, last corner when Baldessari had that save and a half and Nidhi took Agatha off as well. That was a great moment. 300s have been action-packed all through the season. Still quite scary, I'm not going to lie, to commentate on some of those races. Um, and British Junior Supersport, some crazy moves going on, um, which I know have concerned Neither the organisers. are my favourite classes to watch. It's just worrying. Just and to I know touch it, on that. Yeah. I, I know it concerns the organisers both at World Superbikes and BSB, and, and it would, wouldn't it? Because it's, you know, young kids, and you just don't know what's going to happen. So... I, th- I think it's fair to say, though, the accidents we have had in Super Sport 300, the really two bad ones um, over the last two years, could have happened in any class, on any circuit, Agreed. at any time. However... Oh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't class-specific, that's for sure. No, no. However, there, it's still dodgy to watch, isn't it? It's, I don't know. It's a very difficult one to um, to talk about, really, because what do you do? I think the problem is, though, when the bikes are so easy to ride, easy to ride, it does mean the the riders of less calibre are able to get through to the front. And then I think they get a bit giddy sometimes and pull some silly moves. I do think the riding standards have got much better this year, though. I will say that. You know, I remember... Which is good. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, I remember the riders being called into the pit lane in Portimao last year and being shouted at. Uh, and Stuart Higgs stopped a race at Silverstone because of the safety car chaos, if you remember. Um, so things have improved in both championships dramatically. But yeah, it, I do enjoy those races, though. They are, I, mean, they're, I mean, if you go and watch as a punter at the track, it's pretty spectacular, but it's still a bit, a bit edgy, I think. So hopefully, I uh, hopefully the next few years with these age increases. We're in a transitional period now, aren't we? Um, and obviously, you know this better than most, Dave, because you keep in such good contact with all the up-and-coming riders at BSB in particular. But it has caused a bit of a problem for those riders who are stuck now in that window and can't move up, can they? Johnny Garnett and some of the other talent cut guys. They can't go anywhere. Maybe in the long run, it no. won't be a bad thing, actually. But it must be frustrating for them. It, you know, it, it the, may be not. And I think that's, that's mm. why... Um, Josh Watley took his chance in GP mm, when he maybe. when he did because they knew the age was changing, so he uh, had to take his chance this year. And he's true. he hasn't shown his true talent in in Moto Three this year, but the the, the boy mm. can ride, um, and he's been sort of overshadowed yeah. by Scott a little bit. But if he didn't take that chance, it would be two more years before he could take it. So he yeah, because how, be how old is gonna... how old is Josh Watley now? Seventeen. He's just. I think 18. he's 16, if not just turned 17. Oh, really? Oh, right, okay. okay. Yeah, he's a couple of years younger than Scott, I'm sure he is, because Scott's now, eight. he was 18 in October. Right, so as you say, had he not gone, had he not gone, he would have then had to wait till his 18th birthday, yeah. And you exactly. have to be, eight, you so have the to be 18 Johnny on the 1st of January going into that year. I think that's the rule, isn't it? Something like that. I would suspect so. I don't race. think they're going to be yeah. changing it. Like they did for Jorge Lorenzo when he came no. up and, and Mark yeah. and Fabio and people like mm-hmm. that. But yeah, um, yeah, when you look at, at Johnny Garnes coming through, Reece Stevenson, um, mm. Harley McCabe, all the guys in, in BTC that are coming through, Carter Brown, Evan Belford, trying desperately not to miss everybody out. And then all of a sudden you name the whole grid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it's going to be a difficult transition for them because they can't do what Max Cook's done. Because he went to, and we're digressing from World Superbikes, but you, obviously you do do the commentary on the, the super sport at, uh, at, yeah. uh, on the support classes at BSB. Yeah. And the, the, the boys now are going to struggle to go to CEV and do what Scott did, do what Max Cook did. And, you know, for Scott, it worked. For Max Cook, unfortunately, it didn't. But he's back in the UK. He's a junior super stock champion and a... A yes. British superbike rider at the age yes. of twenty-one. Yeah, is he twenty? Twenty-one. Uh, I, I should They're not going to be able well. to get the chance to I do think that because two I years in 20, Spain was yeah. was so useful. I think he might be twenty because I seem to remember saying he was nine. I'm sure he was nineteen when the season started, so I think twenty sounds right. Yeah, I think that's great, actually. By the way, and well done to FS3 and Nigel and Darren and everyone for pushing for that. It's a bit. You could say it's a bit of a risk. But I like the fact they're doing it, and I like the fact as well you've got people like Bradley Peary going up into BSB as well. Some really interesting names into BSB next year. 
And yes, we've lost some big names, haven't we? With people like, you know, there's no Skinner anymore, no Taz McKenzie. But there's some great guys to watch out for. It's going to be good, actually. It's going to be really good. I like it as a, as a transition period yeah. for, for BSB to blood some of the rookies. Um, just, just while we're on that subject, Tim Neve, or, uh, McCann Tim Yamaha. Neve, of course. Um, there's a, I think there's a couple Pressure. more still to be announced as well that, yeah. that will become... One, one's probably not a massive surprise, but I think one will be. But they're all talented lads. Excuse me. And I think of the ones that have been announced so far, like you say, with Brad Peary, Max Cook, Tim Neve, um, they're, they're fantastic additions to, to the British Superbike Championship. And if you've got four, five, six rookies coming through in the same season, you've got someone to, to match yeah. yourself to. Liam yeah. Delves coming through last year didn't really have anyone to, to match himself to. Very true. So now and there's five, five or six coming through and you're like, okay, these boys can now gauge themselves against each other. Yes, a couple of them are on factory bikes, but they're still super bike rookies. And um, I know he's, he's not I'm a rookie. I'm really keen to see how they go. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I know he's not a rookie, but Ryan Vickers on the OMG bike as well. That's going to be a, a hell of a thing to watch. I mean, there's so many talking points in BSB for next year as well as World Superbikes. It's going to be really interesting. I think there's going to be some surprises in BSB, you know, especially with the new format too. You know, nobody's going to be locked out. Yeah, the new points. You might as, get a new a explained run. on the show. Yes, I listened to that. I did. He did a good job of explaining it too, didn't he? Um, yeah, because st- I've heard lots of different reactions about that. Um, I put a message in the Eurosport WhatsApp group. I did one of those new, you know, you can do those poll votes now on WhatsApp. I thought I'd just try one of these. And um, yeah, showdown yeah. or no showdown. And it was quite it was quite a 50-50 split. I went no showdown simply on the basis that I think it was getting a bit dodgy with riding standards, as we saw with the carnage at Alton Park. People have been getting hurt. And the, we've seen it, haven't we, Dave, a few times in the last few years with the showdown starting. Everyone goes mental. Um, so, yeah, I think from that point of view, it would be better. Could it be confusing with different point systems? Maybe a bit at first, but we're going to have to just keep on top of it, aren't we? I'm sure it'll be on the TV graphics. And obviously on the telly, we'll all be talking about it as well. Um, yes, it means if your bike is stronger at Brands Hatch or you are stronger at Brands Hatch, there's more points up for grabs. But... You know, the sidecars have been doing double points at Brands Hatch. I know BSB is not doing double points, but the sidecars have been giving away 50 points for a win at Brands in the finale for the last several years. So let's see. Let's see. But at least it doesn't lock people out, does it? And for sponsors, it's good as well because you're still in the running. And you might get a late charge from someone shooting up from ninth to, to fourth or, or even higher or someone going the other way. Well, have a look at the last round at BSB when it was a BMW fest. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if if, if Hickey or Danny mm. Buchan or whoever had won all three races at Brown. Yeah. yeah. They still wouldn't have finished higher than ninth. Exactly. And you think of poor Jason O'Halloran as well, don't you? I mean, this is this is the one person everyone's been talking about. Because they've been, I know um, Stuart Higgs and the team were working out permutations, weren't they, as to what would have happened in previous seasons. And obviously, in theory, that's what would have happened. In reality, it wouldn't because everyone rides to the rules you have in place at that time. But even so, they've clearly worked it out and it clearly works well looking back through history, doesn't it? So it's going to be interesting. Yes. But yeah, let's hope, fingers crossed from a, well, it's not from, a, it's a biased point of view, but let's hope Jason Hatterer can have a chance because he really deserves it. He really does. I mean, it's, it's been terrible to see what's happened the last two years. It really has. It came across... It came across in in the podcast. I mean, I, I've I've been a, 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 a supporter, not a fan. I don't like them. I am. I'm just a big fan. Yeah. Aren't I really. We all are. Who, yeah, exactly. we all are. Who's not? Who's not? We're a fan yeah. of all the riders. Um, yeah. I think that uh, Jason's been one over the years where you kind of think he's 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 not had the rub of the green that that no. other riders maybe have had. Yeah. You know, he could have been he could have been national superstock champion. But for Danny Buchan on the MSS Kawasaki, that was an absolute missile when <laughs> yeah. he was on the Honda that shouldn't have done what it did. But he and the team made it do what it did. Yeah. Um, and a bit of a tough time at Honda when the Honda wasn't at its strongest. It only ever seemed to work at, at Snetterton and Donington. Mm. But then to jump on the Yamaha and have the chances that he's had, obviously he broke his shoulder, didn't he, at Alton Park? Um, yes. In that test at two miles an hour. Usually the slowest yeah. crashes are... are the, 
hurt the most sometimes. And that was all kept um, quite quiet, wasn't it, generally? I mean, people in the paddock got whispers of it, but even a lot of people in the paddock didn't know quite how badly that was Baxter well was. well underrated. Yeah, yeah. Was such such 20... is, is the BSB paddock in yeah, 2020. They, I think it was 20, wasn't it? Yeah, was it, it 21? Been... Was it 21? Uh, or was it 21? With the pandemic, yeah, everything's remember. blurred into one for me. But no, everything's all... Yeah. I think it was... Oh, it could be 20. I, I don't know. Maybe no, maybe not. I think it might have been 20 because surely 21, he won the first three races. He, he won the, yes. the hat trick at the opening yes. round, didn't he? At, yeah. At Alton Park. So it must be before. But even so, yeah, he, he has been bashed up a few times. And then Alton Park this year was like, you couldn't believe it, could you? For it to unravel no. like it did. I mean, the McCam- the poor McCam's team, you have to say, what a nightmare that was. Um but anyway, hopefully now, Jason's in, obviously, very much going to be the number one rider. And, you know, there's no teammate to have to worry about. We're not expecting Neves to challenge him, I think it's fair to say. Um, no, that's, the title that's, a, that's a fair shout. Across the season. I'm sure Tim wouldn't mind me saying It's a that. true number one rider rather than a 50-50 yeah, share. Exactly. And you're not going to have potential nuisance McKenzie as he was for Jason at times and vice versa. You're not going to have collisions between Taz the two is a though. nuisance to everybody. <laughs> Taz, if you're watching. And you um, get to commentate on him next season now. Yes. Yeah. And that is exciting, isn't it? And I think that's a really that interesting was a segue, wasn't it? It was, wasn't it? Taz McKenzie to Supersport for anyone who's just catching up with this. So what's happening there is the MIE team, Midori Mariwaki's team, uh, running in... A collaboration with MS Racing, which is all being announced in the next few days. Um, the Spanish team, which won the Supersport 300 title with Mark Garcia in 2017. They did win a Supersport race in 2020, if you remember, at Barcelona, when Andy Vidoya stayed out in a catastrophic rainstorm on slick tyres, went through the first sector and the red flag came out, but they won the race. Um, so that's the team they're going to be running in collaboration with. So the workshop will all come out of Madrid, but it is Midori Moriwaki chiefly heading up that operation. Adam Noridin will be on the other bike, and I believe that's all to do with Patronus sponsorship, which is yet to be confirmed as we record this, but I'm pretty sure that's what will happen, which would make sense, as he's a Malaysia. Um, but apparently he'd been knocking on the door for quite some time, so I think there was a lot of interest from a lot of riders. And another big thing, of course, Dave, is the Honda CBR600, which until recently, with all the Yamaha domination, had all the records in Supersport, is back on the grid. So it takes us up to six manufacturers. We've seen Davy Todd racing that bike to some pretty decent success, haven't we, on the roads at the Northwest and the TT. So how good would it be in Supersport? I think with the regulations, it'll be there or thereabouts. And if it's not, they'll boost it. If it's too good, they'll peg it back a bit. So it's going to be great. And Taron McKenzie on a Supersport bike. Unlike Bradley Ray, unfortunately for Brad, Taz will be able to go to all the circuits. Brad's missing all the flyaways, isn't he, with the, the change in the regulations from yes. Dorna. They're not paying for all the teams to go to all the flyaways. So sadly for Bradley Ray and Moto X, he will not do Phillip Island, he won't do Indonesia, and he won't do Argentina towards the end of the season. Uh, but Taz will, and he'll be able to learn all these tracks. And I think it's a pretty... I think it's probably a, a good... A, a secret, what's a best kept, worst kept secret, I should say, worst kept is that it's, is that it's, <laughs> is that it's a two year deal for McKenzie, which will almost certainly see him on the super bike in 2024. I think he's in a good place there, you know. I think I'd rather be on a Honda Super Sport bike with MIE than on their super bike at the moment. Nothing against MIE, but we know more or less where that bike's going to be, certainly at the start of the year, um, with Eric Granada and Hafez Shirin. So, yeah, Taz McKenzie World Supersport. And, of course, he's not the first, is he? It's, it is the traditional route in many ways. Ray, Crutchlow, Sam Lowe, and many others. It is. That's just, it know. is, but not at 27 years of age. True. but That's, it, that's it, what's it, thrown most people. They, most people, when it was it, the, the whispers came out that Taz was going to Worlds, they it yeah. automatically assumed yeah, it course. was going to be on a World Superbike. Yeah. But well, it, he'd been trying with Barney Ducati before, uh, with Go 11 Ducati, hadn't they? But, no, it's, I think yeah. it's quite... I think it's quite a smart move, actually, don't you? Honestly, what do you think? I think it. I genuinely do. Yeah, yeah. I, I genuinely do. Mm, I, do. Um, I think it's equally or possibly a better move for Taz than the Yamaha deal for him. Um, I yeah. Think Brad is yes. is physically more suited to the R1. Taz has done some great work on it, but as he said on the podcast mm. a couple of weeks ago, he's not the most gifted of riders, and he has to work really hard. And he's yeah. won a title on an R6 before 
on a super sport bike on the Yamaha R6 when he was riding yes. for um, Team Traction Control, if I remember rightly. And he was up there in uh, junior superstock as well against the likes of Andy Reid and Carl Ride and, mm. and guys like that. So he's, he's mint on a super sport bike. There's no question. So I'm, I'm keen good. to see what he can do. And I think mm. he's what he'll know a couple of the tracks, certainly when we get to Europe from his time at Red Bull Rookies. So he, he's not yes. going to take too much time learning tracks as far as the European legs go. Mm. So I I think he's going to be there or thereabout. If he's not in the top six week in, week out, I, I, top eight maybe, I'd, I'd be quite surprised. Because well, the Honda aren't going back to make up the numbers, are they? And, and World Superbike won't want them there to make up their numbers. They want to make a point of another manufacturer fighting for podium positions. So, and interestingly I mean, and as well. Uh, the... Go on, Dave, sorry. Sorry, as, as the announcement came via Honda, not via the team as well. It's, it's sort of yes. an unofficial announcement. It's kind of yeah. pissed on the, the, the team's fireworks a little bit that Honda have released who's yeah. going where before the team have announced yeah. it. Yeah. Which yeah. is what Dave Miller at Bike Sport News picked up on yesterday, and rightly so. Yeah. Um, the fact that there's Honda support there is is vital. Yeah, I and Honda Japan as well. Interestingly, um, it's Honda Japan now. Of course, before it was Tenkata, but it was HME. It was Honda Motor Europe, but it's Honda Japan who've done a few wild cards and things in the past, but never really had serious involvement like this. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think the MIE announcement will probably go out today, Tuesday, or possibly tomorrow, Wednesday, the 14th it'll be for whenever you're watching this. Um, but yeah, Honda put it all out, didn't they, in their Monday announcement. Uh, so it's out there, but it's not out there. But as you say, Dave Miller picked it up at Bike Sport News, and rightly so. But it's going to be... I think it's going to be... Yeah, someone said to me yesterday, that bike's going to be nowhere, that team's going to be nowhere. I'm not sure I agree. And I, I hope... How do we know? That is... Exactly. How can they know? How can they possibly know? We've never seen this Honda with these next generation super sport rules. And the way the rules are engineered shouldn't mean it's nowhere. It's going to be there or thereabouts. The only one disadvantage they might have, and I hope they don't, but they might, is that there'll only be these two Hondas on the grid unless somebody wildcards one somewhere, which I think is probably unlikely. That could be a downfall for them. Uh, then again, MV were doing well, weren't they, at the end of the season? And they don't have it. It's not like you've got a load of Yamahas or Ducatis. And ironically, there's a load of Ducatis on the grid, and they were the only manufacturer who didn't actually win a race. So maybe the, have, the fact there's two Hondas won't matter too much. I certainly think that team... Probably not. Taz should be able to mould it around him, I think, because you will suspect him to be the, the leading rider, surely. Um, I'd be Couldn't surprised agree if he more. wasn't. Yeah. So I think if he can mould it around him... I know Midori Mariwaki, who I caught up with the other day... Speaks very highly of Taz McKenzie. Um, and of course, Neil will be around, I'm sure, as well, bringing that extra energy in the garage. Neil won't get too involved like some motocross dads would do. He'll be there when he's needed. But Neil's not an idiot, is he? So he's not going to be poking his nose in the whole time. But he'll be there when, when they need anything. Uh, Mick Shanley, as well, I believe, is linked with that project. I don't know if that's officially confirmed. I don't believe it is. But I believe Mick Shanley will be around with that project as well for 2023 um so watch out for that Twang. yeah working more on the superbike side <laughs> i think but it's the same team so um yeah watch out for some big names in that mie team in 2023 <laughs> i did i did i did speak to mick i think it was at um uh, it might have been at brands hatch and um and he did say his plans it's staying in the paddock mm. but was moving away from kawasaki so that kind yeah. of does stack up a little bit. I but, think uh, putting two and two together. And such a great... Yeah, we, as you yeah. do, as, as a journalist in there's a journalist in yeah. you does. I've been wrong I, before. I've never professed to being a journalist. No, neither you have can. I. But not really. I, I have been wrong before, but I'm, I'm quite confident about that one. But we'll see. That's my prediction. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> Talk to me about Brad Wright. You know, I feel a bit sorry for Brad Ray. Well, I do and I don't. Do you? Incredible year. Well, just in the sense he's going to miss that's those first two rounds. Well, no, that's my first feeling. I'm, I'm going to feel sorry for him. No, okay. I don't feel sorry for him in the sense he's got his World <laughs> Superbike opportunity. And him and Shaky have put together a great deal, obviously. To, and they pushed and pushed and pushed with Andrea Dossoli. And he rates Brad Ray anyway, Andrea Dossoli. But I do feel sorry for Brad in the sense that 
he's going to have to be watching everyone at Phillip Island and he won't be able to be out there himself, whether he's watching on the telly with us or whether he's there. And I suspect he might be there, but whether he is or not, how how annoying must that be as a rider? He, he must be itching to want to be out there. He's going to start to Aston at round three. Everyone else is going to be two rounds ahead of him. That's why I feel sorry for him. But it will be great to have him there. And we're going to have three of the last four British Superbike champions in the world paddock. And I think that's great. I really do think that is great for world superbikes and for the British superbikes. Um, OK, it's a shame you won't see Taz racing at BSB. But Taz might be back in BSB one day. You just never know. And I think he knows he'll always have a place there if he ever needed to come back. But he's always said, I want to be a world championship rider. So going back to your question, Brad Ray is with the Moto X team. Now, they're not known to be the best team on the grid. However, Yamaha, probably better than anybody, really do treat their customer teams very well indeed. You throw Ducati in there as well. Um, it's not like Kawasaki who keep it very much separate, don't they? And Honda are quite similar, although I'm hearing this year might be a bit more work between the two teams. But certainly Yamaha do treat their teams very well. I'm sure Brad will have access to all the data from Locatelli, Toprak. I don't know how useful Toprak's data will be with his riding style. You know, I know Locatelli can't always do much with it. James Tozen's always said to me, you know, like engine braking calibration and things like that. How can you calibrate the engine braking when the rear tires off the ground so much? So imagine what it's like for the other riders comparing that data or trying to. I think Bradley Ray's in a good place. He's got Shaky Burn alongside him all the way. Shaky's going to be a all, I'm sure, or certainly most of the rounds. Um, it's going to be exciting. He's got Andrea Dossi. He's got all the data, all those other Yamaha people. I think he just needs to be smart. Keep it on the island. It's easy for me to say, isn't it? You don't want to be crashing too much. It is a smaller team with less budget. Let's remember that. In theory, all these bikes start the season with equal equipment, but we know that's not quite going to be the case. And certainly as the season goes on, yes, there is a rule that states that enough parts have to be available before you put them on your factory bike. But that doesn't mean Moto X will have the budget to buy all these new parts. Um, no, but he's not but a crasher anyway, that. is he? He's not a crasher. He's not a crasher. He's a smart guy. Look what he's done in BSB. And I think he's just got to go to Worlds, learn some of the circuits he doesn't know. That's always a big thing. They all talk about that, don't they? Toes and Whittam. Um, we shouldn't be too complicated, but he's not been going around some of these tracks like some of the others have. I know he's done rookies in the past, so he'll know a few of them. But there's places like Magni Corps, for example. Uh, Imola is very likely going to be back in July if it goes through. Hopefully it will. Uh, and we'll have Imola back on the circuit, on the schedule. It's great. I, I think it's great we've got the reigning BFP champion again, as we did when Scott Redding came across what will be three years earlier, in the World Superbike Championship. And he deserves it. And I really do think it's good to see this progression. Um Obviously, some people in Britain like to have the British riders staying in Britain. I think we want to see them move up, don't we? Surely. See what they can do on the world stage. And I, surely 100%. that's only a good thing for BSB as well. This is the thing that I struggle with sometimes on some of the, the Facebook forums. And, and when you look, oh, no, he needs to, Brad needs to do another year in, in BSB and consolidate. Why? Consolidate what? Yeah. Jonathan consolidate Ray says... What? And Jonathan get injured Ray. in the start of the season and miss yeah. half of the season because he's con tried to consolidate. I don't. And then that, so. and then get that's your world. That's yourself. your world chance. Got Jonathan Ray always said, "You don't want to get." And I'm paraphrasing Jonathan Ray here. You don't want to get stuck in the British Superbike Championship or whatever your national Superbike Championship is before anyone hammers me in the PSP paddock. No, it's um, way to, know, exactly. Whether you're coming from the 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 Asian Superbike Championship, Moto America, Spanish, French, British, wherever. You want to move on to the World Championship, don't you? Whether it's MotoGP or, or World Superbikes. So they've got a... They've Taz got could have quite easily... Mm, of course you have. Taz could have quite easily stayed in BSB for the next 13 years, yep. injury permitting, and, you know, made a, good, a very on, good on, life for himself. On, yeah, on very good money, I was just about to say. because there's, on, there's very probably, good, on good money, you know, on good yeah. machinery. Yeah. No particular... But he's a single lad. He's no family ties in terms of children and things like that. So mm. why would you not want him to better himself exactly. at the earliest possible opportunity? The opportunities haven't come as early as they did for Johnny and Cal and um, and Tom Sykes as they did in 08 and 09 and Alex mm. Lowe's in 13. But at the end of the day, he's got to take that chance. 
And yeah. this, he didn't get the chance last year that yeah, he so wanted with Yamaha. And I know that caused a lot of consternation for Taz. Mm -hmm. But staying and consolidating a series where you crash at Cartagena on a on a private set, yeah. you launch it at Silverstone on the main straight and break your other ankle, and you miss the Assen World Superbike wildcard. Yes. So much for consolidation. Yes. And yeah. it wasn't his it wasn't his choice to consolidate. That was the um Yeah. That was that was circumstances. But that shows what can happen. And he's now got his chance and he's taken it with both hands and he should be applauded for it. I completely agree. I think in life in general you've got to move outside your comfort zone sometimes. And yes, it is a bit uncomfortable at the time, but then if you do achieve something, what a great feeling that is. Whatever it is you want to achieve in your life. So there was no doubt was there in Taz McKenzie's mind. Um, no doubt whatsoever. He was always going to try and do it. They wanted to get into the Go 11 team, didn't they, a couple of years ago, and they wanted crazy money. It's probably true to say, you know, there's probably more better paid rides across the board in the British Superbike Championship than there are in the World Superbike Championship, which when you think about it, Agreed. is utterly ridiculous. That should not be the case for a national series. But it, again, it shows how strong BSB is with the finances in place, the sponsorship in place. Um, and it does show that times are tough. But anyway, they're in the World Championship, putting the economics to one side, which I'm no expert in anyway. Well, I'm not really an expert in anything at all for that matter. <laughs> but I think it's great. It's great. You and me it's both. great they're there. It's great Taz is there and it's great Brad's there. So I, but I do feel sorry for Brad in the sense he's going to have to sit on the sidelines and watch those first two rounds. That's going to be tough. Then again, he knows, he knows that, doesn't he, going into the season. Um, and his choice was, well, you can either have a European... World Superbike Championship season or or no World Superbike Championship season. So what are you going to do in that situation? That's you know, that's exactly uh, right. I tell you what, is, is, you know, we said we were doing the guinea pig thing today with the with um, Squadcast as we're yeah. as we're doing this now rather than Zoom. We yeah. also um, we've developed very recently, i.e., last night, um, developed a that's Telegram broadcast challenge, the uh, broadcast channel, and uh, a chat group. Um, Something a bit different. It's basically ripped from um, Diary of a CEO from Stephen Bartlett. It's it's a place to bring people together to chat about motorcycle racing. And as I said to you earlier on, um, we only have three rules, and most of them are are fairly. The, the three rules are quite basic. Um, in so much as just respect people's opinion, be nice because it's. It's 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 good to be nice, and <laughs> it is. The, it is, and then when you sometimes on social media, people won't put their opinion down for fear, fear of being shot down by some mm. smart ass or something like that. Yeah. So on um, on Telegram, we have a private group, off track podcast. Um, we have a broadcast channel, so we can put out little videos, little um, behind the scenes stuff, and I'll post this picture on there as well. Um, or oh, the picture that we took earlier on of you, you and your. Uh, fabulous model pose but this time can you put your clothes on um <laughs> ideally you said you wanted more followers <laughs> i know it's warm in spain at the minute but the, yeah it's, it's it not that warm surprise. actually it's, it's relatively mild no. he relatively he mild for, for... He, he loves it viewers. <laughs> but you can pay extra so, for so that having this telegram we, we've got uh, we've got a few members in there now i've realized how to use it because there's a broadcast mm -hmm. channel and there's a chat channel so we've got them both together and Please. i did ask for some questions to be put forward for greg because people so people know that's the beauty of joining the telegram group you get the heads up and able to ask questions hide, hide of our behind guests. this cup hide behind the cup yeah um, go on Okay, the no, first, still the be first good. question. Be the first question is from Jennifer. It says, "When are you retiring?" No, I'm kidding. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question from Jennifer, but that will come shortly. Um, the first one, the first question. In fact, there's there's four questions from Craig Lowe. Um, Hello, the first Craig. one is: Is what's your Christmas dinner going to be? Uh, Christmas dinner will be made by my mum in Ulster in Warwickshire. And that'll be, well, everything you can imagine. It, actually, I bought some uh, pate from Fortnum and Mason when I went to see some friends in London recently. So one of them is, uh, I think it's salmon pate with dill and mustard. I don't know how I remembered that. And the other one is more of a standard <laughs> pate. 
So they're going to be spread on the toast. Uh, always like a bit of patty on toast on Christmas Day. But a bit that of a posh thing to do. Like yeah. a bit of paint. Um, yeah. And, yeah, paint, yeah. Okay. It really is. <laughs> say, you're, say you're middle <laughs> class without saying you're middle class. Carry on. <laughs> um, <laughs> you ask the question, I'll give you the answer. And then the rest of it will be... I Craig did. Yeah, Craig. Hello, Craig. Um, then we're going to have what would it be? Yorkshire pudding, parsnips, red cabbage. We don't normally have turkey anymore. It's too dry. So I think it'll be chicken, gravy, obviously, stuffing, uh, mashed potato with swede in it, which is one of my favourites. Peas, carrots, and all the other mint sauce. Cranberry sauce. I love cranberry sauce. A um, bit of cranberry sauce. glasses of a bit of cranberry sauce. And normally my brother and I, my brother Mitchell and I, like to have uh, the limited edition Christmas special glitterberry flavoured J2O to accompany our other beverages, which will be, in my case, probably a glass of white wine or two. So, yes, Wonderful. there you are. I recommend glitterberry J2O. Perfectly they're, comprehensive. They're... I love that. <laughs> I think I've got everything. Perfectly there. comprehensive. You said there was another, there's another three um, questions from Craig, aren't there? Yeah, there are. <laughs> um, I think we've, we've kind of covered this, um, but your thoughts on the different paths people are now having to take to get to World Superbike, with Brad and Taz being the examples for the UK. Like we kind of covered that a little bit, didn't we? Yeah. What I um, will say, just very quickly, I think if part of me on. wants no, to no, say it's, it's, it's never been easier to get into World Championship racing with all these talent cups, so on and so forth. And the other side of me would say it's almost more competitive now because of all these talent cups and everyone crowds into them. Um, although what is interesting is if you look at the MotoGP paddock, a lot of riders have gone through the World Superbike paddock through the stock classes and things like that. So, yeah, I think it depends what you want to do, doesn't it, in a way? And you can't always get what you want. But if you want to go into the GP paddock, if you're coming from, you know, 12 years old now, you've almost got to go through mini bikes, talent cups, junior world championship, and into the, the world championship. If it's the super bike option, I guess it's your national championship. Or going right back again, it's, it's mini bikes, isn't it, Dave, surely? And then up into, is, yeah. you know, or you might do a bit of super motor or whatever at the same time. A lot do motocross, of course. Um, and then up through up to your national superbike championship and into the world championship, a bit like Taz is doing in a nutshell, I guess. It's, it, that's exactly the way. Um, will BMW, Honda, and others ever get to the front consistently to Ooh. challenge Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Ducati? That's a great question. It is a Craig great question, again. and I'm going to risk upsetting someone here. I, I don't know. I mean, if you ask Julian Ryder, he'd go, oh, "Typical BMW, typical BMW," you know. Joe signs of brilliance, and there's a few good rounds in the middle, and then they drop back again. I mean, they, it did look like they were making progress in the middle of the year, didn't it? Donington is always a good BMW track. So is Moss, to be fair. But then they had more good results somewhere, didn't they? Was it Magni Car? I'm trying to remember now. Um, and then they were nowhere again in Barcelona. With, with you know, low grip tracks, they really struggled, don't they? Uh, Indonesia was terrible. I hope, being, but although Australia was good again. So Scott Redding's done some incredible things on that bike. He really has. Um, we know Honda and BM both have the super concessions, of course, which means it's a bit like we talked about before. They, they're they allowed some updated parts, some big updates, actually. So to answer the question, I think they will make progress, yes. Whether they can beat the big three over the course of a 36-round season remains to be seen. But to do that, you're going to need consistency. That's how top racks started getting on top of Jonathan Ray. You had one rider staying with the same team, same bike. That's the only way they're going to do it. So I think if Laquona, Vierge and co stay with the Honda, Reading stays on the BM, it could happen. But if we keep chopping and changing, it's going to be very difficult, in my opinion. Unless Batista retires, obviously, or Jonathan Ray retires, that might be another way to shake it up. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be happening immediately. Batista... I'd say at least one more year, where we know he's got at least one more year. If Alvaro Bautista retired at the end of 23, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but I would be surprised if Jonathan Ray did, that's for sure. But this is something that I've was that I've been reasoning with Brad and, and Taz. Mm. That World Superbike top end isn't going to stay the same for forever. Alvaro no. is on the verge of retirement. Johnny can't be too far away. And Top Rack is desperate to go to MotoGP. So Top Rack's the, the, desperate it, to go to Laquona wants to go back to GPs if he can. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, Axel Bassani no, no, was talking with, with Honda. Um, 
yeah, there's going to be, there will be some movement. Absolutely, there will, yeah. There'll have to be. And you can only do that when you've got a foot in the door. Mm, yeah. So you want to be in that paddock, That's really, right. don't you? So let's you see. Let's see. Um, it's going to be, it's an important year, actually. Well, every year is an important year, but from that point of view, it's particularly important. The last question from Craig, which kind of, kind of follows on from that, is how do you think Remy's going to get on this year? Remy Gardner. That's a really good question. Um, he's testing, as we speak, um, in Jerez. I don't know. I, you'd think he'll go well, but it's not going to be easy, is it? He doesn't know Pirelli tyres. No. Testing's limited. Doesn't know a superbike at all. Um, a lot more flex, of course, than the stiffer bike he's coming from with a prototype. Method. I was just going to say, I don't think he's ever ridden a bike with a hinge in the middle. No, exactly. So he's going to have a, a much softer bike with much softer tyres, which move around a lot underneath you. Um, another thing he's going to have to contend with, which the Honda riders spoke about a lot this year, is three races per weekend. That's three times the the pre-race height. That's three times the debrief. That's three times the tension. Three times the the sweating through a race and the physical exertion that puts through you, um, as well as the mental three challenge. Three starts to races, three opening laps, three times everything. A sprint race where everyone goes hell for leather. But Remy Garner is going to get stuck in. I mean, how good is it that we've got the outgoing Moto2 world champion of 2021 with the reigning world super, double reigning super sport champion, Dominic Agata, and Moto E World Cup winner in the same team, the same family as Top Rack in the Yamaha garage, if you like. Um, how do I think Remy's going to do? I think you've got to look at what people's targets are going into the season. Top Rack, Batista, Ray want to be winning every race if they can and winning the World Championship. Rinaldi, Locatelli, Lowe's, they want to be winning races as much as possible. Where does that leave the likes of Gardner? Top 10 finishes? Doesn't sound enough for Remy Gardner. Top five? Doesn't. It's not, not going to be easy, is it? But you have to think, on pay, realistically... He's going to be wanting to aim for top eight finishes, I suppose, at first, which doesn't sound enough, but it's got to be something like that. You can't imagine he's going to be beating, well, certainly not the top three, and you like to think he won't be beating Andrea Locatelli immediately. That's already fifth position, isn't it? Uh, and then throw Rinaldi and Axel Bassani on the independent Ducati, uh, and there'll be others around. <laughs> Tom Sykes is back. So I think Gardner will have a good year. It'll be great to see him on the podium at least once. It depends on how he's going to deal with the team as well, I guess, and his crew chief. But look how things went wrong for Garrett Gerloff. He's another one to watch out for. Back with Les Pearson as his crew chief at Bonobo BMW and Loris Baz. How close will they be to the front? Oh, I, I, You have to think Gardner, to begin with, has got away for the top 10, which doesn't sound much. But let's be realistic. Or maybe even points finishes, actually, at first. Top 15. Mm -hmm. I think he'll be solid. But if he can get on the podium, I think that's a good result. If I'm honest. And starting at his home circuit as well. Mm. Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. Because we haven't had this since 2020, have we? It'll be three years. And let's just remember, let's not gauge... <coughs> sorry, Philip Island on this. No, not gauge the season on Philip Island because we're bound to have some crazy results there that we well, don't you never, see. You never could, could you? Did, mm. That no, finish, no, no. was it... Um, yeah. <clears throat> was it Eugene or was it Leon? That, uh, that finish and Giuliani, maybe. Point four point zero zero four thousand at the line, and oh uh, yeah, yeah, it, that... four or five years ago it went Philip Island Buriram, and then yeah. once it came to Europe, it's like right now the championship starts. Yeah, exactly, because it always cocked up my um, fantasy race team. <laughs> every I year. mean, yeah, yeah. Eugene <laughs> won on a Suzuki in 2014, didn't he? Um, yeah. yeah, we had the closest ever finish was Haslam and Fabrizio. Fabrizio. Four thousandths of a second. It was, yeah, um, Michelle Fabrizio. Yeah, but it's great. Remember 2020 when you had uh, Top Rack in his first race for Yamaha, the first race of the season. Alex Lowe's his first race for Kawasaki. Reading in his first World Superbike race on the Ducati. And someone else was in there as well. Va Vandermark on the other Yamaha. And the four of them went across the line together. It was incredible. We, it's very likely something like that could happen again. Let's hope it does. And let's hope I we do get a Gardner or someone in there. So. Yeah. That's marvellous. Thank you, Craig. There's four great yes, questions. Thank that, you very much. You, know, yeah. you had 15 minutes of Greg Haynes all to yourself. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, Jennifer has put a question in on the on the group chat this morning. Quite a pertinent question after what was announced at at, at, um, at the bike show from retirement. BFB. Jennifer, retirement uh, first of all could be any time. So <laughs> just watch this space. I'll just say that. Right. What's the pertinent question? She, she says, Dave, please ask Greg if World Superbike are as keen as putting B, as, as keen as BSB on putting mental health support in place. Ooh. Is this something you're aware of, or do you something you know something that may be happening? This is something that's been bigged up, I know, by um, certain team bosses and other people involved in the British Superbike paddock. And, of course, by Stuart Higgs himself, as we saw at the NEC um, just a few weeks back. And to be honest, no, I, I would be lying if I said I'd seen anything actively promoting a mental health awareness scheme in the World Superbike paddock, other than the usual things you see on social media. Um, we have had riders talking about some of their struggles though uh garrett gurloff was one i remember who was very honest about some of the struggles he's been through james tozer my good mate james has spoken a lot about some of the trauma he's been through not just with his riding but the effects of having his wrist broken seven operations in 11 years you know it stopped him from doing his two things he was passionate about riding a motorbike and playing the piano and james has gone through some dark times and he said it very openly um and I'm sure if you ever get him on the show, Dave, he'll, he'll tell you again as well. Um, so oh, from that great. point of view, yes, it's nice that people people are openly talking about these things. But in terms of a, a big scheme, no, I don't think so, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Not that not that anyone's got anything no. against it. Now, obviously. No, no, of course not. It's just one of those uh, the, uh, mental health motorbike that are coming into BSB. Mm. I think it's a, yeah. it's a fantastic addition. And um, yeah. 18 months ago, JT did explain to me his difficulties on this mm. show oh, of course Thanks he's already been on he's already been on i can't i can't listen to them all i try my best i i did listen i know to that i'm one, on him man. i did listen to that one didn't i i sent it to you I, because that was uh, yeah. before he joined you as a commentator yeah i wondered why you were making a funny face yes yes you did because i remember now i remember one of the things i always look like you, this i remember him saying to you life <laughs> life has stopped at the moment i remember that i do remember yeah the thing, because the that was is, the, it was in that hinterland of time between um, finishing with Danny Webb and Weepol races yeah. and then coming full time with you. Yeah, to hitting the big time, you mean? Yeah. The, um... That's it, hitting the big time. He's made it now. He's, he's yeah. next, sitting alongside you, Greg. That's <laughs> yeah. it. He's, pin he's peaked. JT yeah. has peaked, mate. <laughs> you have, James. Um, um, yeah, I know. The problem is, you see, I've spent so much time listening to you and JT through the year. You just switch off. That's the problem. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> All those voice messages don't go to waste, do they, mate? Um, but what, the final question the is best, from... The, one of the best inventions in recent years. Sorry. I agree. No, I agree completely. We can have a conversation without having a conversation. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the final questions come through from Kev Robinson. Um, the Kev? A, a, lot, a lot of time for Kev. Kev Robinson is the dad of Scarlett Robinson, who races in junior super sport. And yes, she Kev does. has said, can you ever see a girl stroke woman getting into world superbikes? Good luck with the podcast, chaps, and speak soon. Thanks, Kev. Thank, thanks what do you reckon, Greg? Kev. Uh, thanks for the good luck with the podcast. We probably need it, don't we, Dave? Um, <laughs> <laughs> trying out this new system, which just seems to be going well. It's a good question. Big question. Pertinent question. We've got some big issues to deal with here today, haven't we, in terms of um, safety and mental health and of course the women in motorcycling thing obviously this is a big scheme we're hearing a lot about Pippa Laverty very much getting behind it Midori Moriwaki there was a big uh, event actually yesterday as we record this uh, a big thing there and Midori Moriwaki did a particularly moving speech um can I see it happening there's no reason why we shouldn't this is where we have to be very careful here because in this pol politically correct world we are living in in which it seems to be easier than ever to offend people. And I think there's a lot of people out there who are looking to be offended, whether it's whatever it is. Um, whatever it's a choice is. to be offended. Yeah, that's it's a Ricky Gervais line, It's a choice Gervais to be it? offended. Yeah, I think and, it is. It, it, Jen said it all the time. You have to choose to be offended. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's Sorry, Karen. It's, 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 it's true. It's true, whether it's being a vegan or, you know, whatever the issue is. You're going to upset someone somewhere. You have, 
it's a, it's it's a choice to be offended by yeah. something. Some yeah. things you can't help but be offended by if it's exactly. personal or by, to your family. Yeah. But yeah, sorry, carry on, mate. Yeah. No, just, no, 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 no. You're I'm absolutely. A big, right. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I always try to look at this in the most logical way, and as long as you are, because sometimes it's not what you say, it's the way you say it, and it's not what you do, it's the way you do it. So as long as you mean well and you're not actively hurting anyone, either physically or emotionally. I don't know what else you can do in life, really. So, no. about the, the women in motorcycling, let's be honest. Um, yes. The male body is physically stronger than the female body, isn't it? That's a fact. It's biology, it's nature, it generally speaking. Um, I'm generalizing a bit, yes, but generally speaking, it is. What else? I was thinking about this the other day, actually. And it's not just in motorcycle racing or motor racing, sport in general. In fact, you might even say life in general. What's the one big thing women can do in life or do do that men do not do? They can have children and give birth. Therefore, Maybe. it tends to be, and this is where I'm going to potentially get into a dangerous area here. But generally speaking, it tends to be... <laughs> watch someone, watch someone, me sit someone, back. Yeah, someone's going to be furious. <laughs> it tends to be, does it not, the woman who takes time off after giving birth. Not always. Doesn't have to be, but it tends to be, I believe. Am I being fair? So that's another reason sometimes, I, I, I think. No? You can do I paternity leave. I have absolutely no opinion that. on this whatsoever. Okay, I'm this, hanging you out to dry on this one. <laughs> if, if I am, if anyone thinks I'm being unfair, please tell me. And I will assess the comments fairly. I really will. I'm just trying Drop to look at this in a, in, a, in a, <laughs> and I can pass I'm just trying to look at this way. in a logical way. But that's another thing. We'll go over, come back to that after or not. But in terms of the, the body and the strength thing, that's definitely a factor, especially in motorcycle racing, I think, even more than cars. Because the rider, of course, is one third, approximately, of the overall mass, the overall weight of the machine and has a huge bearing, of course, in how they throw the bike around weight distribution and how it accelerates, how it breaks, how it turns its direction, center of gravity, blah, 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 blah. Much more so than in car racing. Um, and it, with the women not having such a strong body, naturally, it's going to be more difficult, isn't it? Let's be honest. Now, traditionally, I think it was always seen that bikes were a dirty mechanical thing to do. And going back, of course, right back, say the World War II days, it was the men who did the physical jobs and it was the women who stayed at home and looked after the kids and did the cooking and all the rest of it. Rightly or wrongly, that's how it was at that time. And of course, that yes. carries on in history, doesn't it? So it's not going to change overnight. I think it's great that they're encouraging more women to get involved. And we're seeing it at BSB. Faye Ho has a great initiative, of course. You mentioned Scarlett there, um, Dave, and there's many others coming up through the order. Uh, Charlotte Marcuzzo had a pole position in the very first race of the year at Silverstone for British Junior Supersport. Uh, we've seen, if you look at sidecars, female passenger, they are champions in the British Championship and the World Championship. Uh, Todd Ellis, of course, the driver, and his own partner is um, world champion and British champions as driver and passenger, um, Emmanuel Clermont. So that's, that's, there you are, that's a perfect example right there. One thing I would say, though, is... I think in the same way sometimes that the race thing can be perceived as being controversial, I don't think we want to differentiate the women too much because in my opinion, they're just as equal an opportunity as for any other person. So sometimes, and some people might think that this is sexist, I don't think it is. I think the more you try and differentiate the women competitors, why would you consider them in a different class? Why can't they just have equal opportunities to the men? Um, so, you know, they can. I, I, if they're quick enough, they're quick. Enough. Exactly. Exactly. Now, it doesn't matter. You might say, though, that it is true that some of the team bosses or the sponsors, because of the way it's been traditionally, would think, oh, she's a girl. That sounds a terrible thing to say. But there probably are some who think like that. I, I could um, say there's probably still some uh, some of that in the, in the older yeah. generations, yes. maybe. But I think as, as, yeah. as generations change and team managers change and sponsors are becoming younger yeah, and absolutely. the generations change, yeah. then that's the way that it will come through. 
Um, yeah. From Anna Carrasco. My from... apologies. My apologies to Anna. No. And we... also for interrupting you there, Dave. But Anna Carrasco, right. right? Super Sport three hundred champion, twenty eighteen world champion. There's another yes. example. I think in, in answer to Kev's question, yes, I can I can see it happening from from my side. I can see yeah. it, we can having a, a lady rider in in um, world superbikes. The only thing that I see at the minute is that there aren't any proven lady riders, female racers, however you want, however you, however you want to put it out of what they are, lady racers. Yeah, yeah. they're all racers. Yeah, of the female of, of of the female variety, whatever, whichever way you want to put it. Yeah, and that's just stress for it to anyone. Anyway. Proven. Sorry, on. sorry, there's a bit of a delay on the call. <laughs> um, I'll try to get in on the. Sorry, Dave. Yeah, this. I think what we're trying to say here as well is it, you can be male, female. It doesn't matter what nationality you are, skin color. Um, you know whether you are. Yeah, you as a racer. Exactly. Heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual. It doesn't matter. You can be whatever you want to be. We shouldn't be judging people on who they are, what they do, what their hobbies are, where they live, where they come from. It really shouldn't matter, should it? It really shouldn't matter. It doesn't. doesn't matter to me. I don't care. Races are races. Yeah, that's my opinion on the matter. Um, And they're all quicker than me. Yeah, well, me too, for sure. Sorry, you were saying something before. (laughs) The only thing that we haven't seen yet is yeah. the progress of a female rider onto a bigger bike. Mm, We've had true. Chloe Jones in Stock Six, who had a difficult yeah. year. But of the age yeah. group that the the, the, the the girls are coming through now, it's going to be four or four years, maybe three, four seasons before they can get their chance to go onto a Stock Thou. We haven't seen yeah. any lady racers take on a big bike yet or be no that is true reasonably six reasonably successful yeah. on a world super sport yeah on a, on a world super sport machine or a world super bike machine so that's it, yeah. the thing that i'm not too sure of you think of people like moment. um yeah. katia ponson a few years ago uh catherine green is another one we could mention of course who won a, a race at um i think it was cadwell park wasn't it dave in the 125 class uh, at catherine green won at cadwell yeah she did yeah yeah, yeah. in one two fives exactly but again it was on a smaller bike um i i think it's a bit of everything we've already touched on whether it be the the physical side or um the fact it is a woman and not a man who gives birth. And there's been some ridiculous, some ridiculous talk about things like this in the press over the last year or so, not being able to define what a woman and a man is. And I'm sorry, if anyone takes offence, then I can only apologise. But let's get real here. Let's stop being so silly because it's this has got out, out of hand. A lot of this silly... Uh, I had this silliness that's going on. Let's just be normal and let's have a bit of common sense. That's got to be one of the reasons, hasn't it? Surely. Not in everyone's case. I am generalising a bit, I admit. But I think it's a logical way of looking at it, isn't it? Surely. I I had this on a, on a podcast I did on a, a PR company in Sheffield, had me on their podcast, uh, um, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. Mm. Um, and they're opening, they're opening four questions, like icebreakers, things like that, and said, what's your unpopular opinion? My unpopular opinion was... You're born with a hamburger or a hot dog. Deal with it. There are certain cases where that isn't the case, chemically imbalanced, and I, I fully appreciate that there are yeah. differences in that sense, that people yeah. have different feelings and it, it yeah. is a different chemistry and things have maybe gone slightly awry, so they change it to what they feel is right for them. Yeah. Perfect. No problem yeah. with that at all. Of course not. There are only... There are only two. You're either male or female. I think so too. And I guess we're, we're <laughs> getting into... Some... <laughs> Maybe getting... I'm just... Oh, it's, it's a big hole we're going to dig in here, but that's that's just my view. Well, um, it's, it's my view yes, as well. For what certain... it's worth, we're all entitled to an opinion and, and free speech. You know, things like yeah. the, sing, the singer Sam Smith wanting to be identified as they as opposed to he or she it all just nah, seems... the pronouns things a whole different ball game i don't understand that and i don't no. profess to having any understanding no, of it i I'm don't not, i i am i am he him if that's the case uh, yeah yeah but fair enough 
Fair enough, you know. I remember when Prince, yeah, each to their own. Each Prince, to their own. I'm not Prince gonna... the singer was identifying as a symbol. You can identify as whatever you want to identify as. Who am I to say whether that's right or wrong? Is there a right or wrong? Is it just no? It's there. It's out no, there. You can ent- you, you can identify as whatever you like, but you're still male yeah. or female. It's biologically. It's that's biologically absolutely. The case. Yes, <laughs> I, I don't see why we've got into a situation. I think people have got too much time on their hands and I'm going to annoy someone somewhere by saying this, but I just think we need to take a sensible pill here. Um, Get what, busy. You, you, <laughs> I think so. And I hope, I hope that hasn't, I think most, let's, I would like to think most people see the common sense side of things here. Um, but I think just, they do, but I think they uh, do. Yeah. I would love to Certainly see, in a motorcycle uh, racing community. Mm, yeah. And it is a, ma- a macho environment. It's less so probably than it used to be, but it is. Bikes and, and, is. and men slash guys have always gone together, haven't they? Traditionally speaking. Um, they, uh, uh, Maria Costello is another example. I mean, the, the Maria the Costello, think, perfect, yeah. With some of her TT success uh, and what she's done for Jenny the industry. Timmer. Jenny Timmer. See, um, James Whittam always says, you know, one of the most competent uh, trap day teaching riders he has ever known. And as well as being a very nice stunt person. rider, stunt rider as well. Indeed, I forgot about that. So yeah, but it is, it is true that as in as, seen... in as in stunts in movies, not like mm. um, Lee Bowers, not, not that kind of stunt riding. <laughs> the actual Hollywood movie yeah, stunt yeah, riding. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Yeah, although she could pull a mean wheelie. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I. I wonder what it will have to take, though, for um, just thinking out loud for a female rider to succeed in, in the superbike class or let's say the MotoGP class. I guess we're going in the right direction, aren't we? The next few years should Definitely. tell. Oh, yeah, every, every journey starts with a first step, doesn't it? Yeah, because nobody can and just the first jump on a world made. superbike. Yeah, nobody can jump on a world superbike or a MotoGP bike male or female, and do well immediately. They're going to have to come up through the ranks. And there are several girls slash women coming up through the ranks now. So fingers crossed yeah. it'll happen sooner rather than later. I really hope it does. How good would that I be? Hope I don't know how good that, that would be. You? <laughs> you did a bit, Kev. I hope it was a... Let us know uh, what you thought of our answers. Whether they were but fair, I, it, whether it, they were just... accurate, I don't know. I, th- I think they were fair and accurate, mate. I think we, we, we're we still in that infancy stage, aren't we, where we don't mm. know quite how it's going to go with um, th- when they get to the, the bigger bikes. The, the no. proof will be in the pudding when they get there. Yeah. And if they start sticking it in the top 10, and the, mm. they've all got their right to be there. So let's yeah. see what comes over the next couple of seasons. You know, I'm just wondering if I haven't set my... Is, it, is the audio coming through all right on this, mate? Because I've just realised I think I'm on my laptop audio, not my... Um, not my no. microphone that sat here. Oh, I th- well, it's, it sounds very good. Whichever one you're coming to. Okay. Is that a bit closer? Does that, does that come a bit louder? Yeah. Or do I get a bit tap, tap the top of the microphone. Ah, okay, mate. And now tap your computer. No, it's definitely coming through the microphone. It's definitely coming through the microphone. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. That Is that staying in? Happy with that. <laughs> yeah, of course it's staying in, mate. Okay. I'm going to edit that out. Um, I tell you what, Greg, that's been fascinating. An hour and really. 22 minutes. Yeah, I'm quite aware, everybody, of the fact I went on a lot in the first few minutes about a weight limit, so I can only well, that's apologize. That's what you're here for. I know, but they're probably all switched that's off, right. haven't that's they? Because everyone, Greg. Every... It's... well, that's true. That's you're the true, guest. Eh? They don't want to hear from me, for God's sake. I'm just a host. <laughs> they don't want to hear from you. You're the guest. <laughs> you're the important one. I uh, know. I just I try not to bang on too much about. Um... What everyone's already heard about for the last few months. I'm trying to think of new stuff to talk about as well, but I think we've covered a few issues. I think a few we've done pretty good there, mate. Co- topics. Can I just ask you, Dave? Because I, like, I always like to throw a topic, a question to you at the end, <laughs> even though you're. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you, Greg. All the best. If you, it's a boring, silly question, really. But who's going to win the World Superbike Championship? And who's going to win the British Superbike Championship? We won't talk about MotoGP for now because we've not really touched on it. Next year. Well, that Peko's going to win that again anyway. Don't worry. Yeah, okay. My boy. Do you my really... boy's going to win that. I, don't think... I said it this year. Well, he might. Yeah. I said well, it right did, from actually. day one you this did. year. And, you did, actually. And, and I'll say it from day one because everybody has their favourite rider in Peko's mind. Not at the detriment no, no, of anybody to be else. Fa- yeah, yeah. No, to be fair, you have always said that. 
right? Uh -huh. is, is, that's my that's my point. Um, for okay. British Superbike, that's a really really good question in terms. Mm. <sighs> Hard it's, actually. Oh. Uh, I think the smart money will be on Jason because he's the one that's you would got the so. consistency with manufacturer and team. Yes. Um, there's been a lot of chopping and changing going around. Maybe, I don't I don't know the Danny Buchan and, and the the uh, Taz team. I don't know because Danny's staying where he is. They'll not be far away. Josh Brooks at FHO, whether the BMW uh, yeah. can put a full season together is going to be crucial. Um, mm. I don't know whether Hickey's really sort of the British champion kind of He'll be there or thereabouts. He'll be taking podiums across the season. Whether he'll put a championship season together, I don't know. Um, Jason can and will. Um, I think so. I don't know. I mean, Ryan Vickers is a dark horse, you know. I said yeah. this on the podcast with with Howie a couple of three weeks ago. Um, 2018, and the, the, the guys and girls listen to the podcast know my thoughts on this. 2018 on the R6 and disappeared. Um, yes. it's it's his best Dominated. chance to make his mark on the championship. Um, Glenn back on a on a Ducati at PBM. PBM. That's a good not shout. Want another repeat of of last no. year. So Glenn and Tommy Bridewell. Tommy how that Bridewell works. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see. So I think uh, uh, you know that's two out of the top three from last season with Glenn and Tommy, and then Jason as well, who was third. Um, Jacko could be in the mix, you know. Do you know? I was going to mention Jacko. Had Jacko. A good season. Yeah, he he could have a good mix. So I think. Yeah. Even though we've lost Brad and Taz and and Tom Sykes, I think we've, it still has the potential, and with the new points system, to be possibly one of the most even championships that we've had since two thousand and nine, when that was an uneven championship, wasn't it? It, um, but from, it was a pretty dominated one. Because that was the, the most uneven championship ever. What about um, Leon so Hasler? Sort of 2008. What about Hasler as well, um, if he's got a good bike underneath him? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Uh, there's all sorts of talk of whether there's sort of rumours coming around that he's going to be on a BMW or he's yeah. going to be doing this, that or the other. Um It remains to be seen. But then again, if it is a BM, then it has to be a competitive BM. And as you look at Brands Hatch at the end of last season, with um, Danny on the podium, Andy Irwin was on the podium, and uh, Hickey was on the podium. There's a BMW yes. lockout in the last yes. race. So, uh, was it BMW lockout? Where did Glenn finish? I'm well, sure there was a BMW now. lockout in one race. Yeah. Sure there, was sure it race one. But I know two? It was might it? have been race two. Yeah, it could have been race two. I seem to think there was anyway. I was a bit preoccupied think, at the time. I, think, I um, think you are right there. But I was preoccupied as well, focusing on the support classes. But I think you might be right. Indeed. And, no, and that's Andy it. Andy Irwin on the Honda. Andy Irwin on the Honda as well will be. He'll, mm. he'll not be shy on that. Yeah. Andy that, Irwin's not shy. It's going to be. No. He's, <laughs> and because it is all open now <laughs> for longer, we could get dramatic. He's not going to have that pressure, are you, after you know the, the last main season round? It's not a nine-round championship anymore, no, which no. Is, unfortunately the showdown did dictate that it was. But now there, you have to manage a whole season. And yeah. that's what Jason said. He'd managed the first part of the season so well yeah. to come into the, the, the showdown phase in the, in the right condition, in the right bike setup. That's why he was so upset with what happened at Alton Park, because he mm. genuinely believed he was going to win the championship with yeah. the way the team was set and the bike was set up. And it didn't happen. And we know, you know, Bradley Ray who was the 2022 Bennett's British Superbike champion. Um, but 2023, that's going to be that's going to be some season, I think. I'm really looking forward to it, both at Worlds and at British level. Yeah. And Worlds is quickly touching on that. I think it's still too early to call. I, I do think you cannot look past those those three at the front because I don't think the no, BMW is no, no, going to be strong enough over a season. And I don't think the Honda will be strong enough unless unless there's some dramatic change. Who knows? Can the quote, they might be able to take it. points off the front three. Yeah, but that, I don't that, see them challenging over the, the course of the season. Same in no. BSB with Josh Brooks. And there'll be some, yeah. um, some spoilers in there. I yeah. think there'll be more... Yeah. 
there might be a more spread podium or a top five, yeah. something like that, rather than the same names. But I think it'll still be the same three that end up in the championship fight. And another thing that's going to be interesting with BSB, very quickly going back to that, is we don't have podium points, podium credits, as they used to be called, of course, podium points in more recent years. We're not going to have that nope, anymore. Just... We're not going to have people being cagey nope. or fighting for a third place to get their podium points. That's out of the window. That's gone. That's a thing of the past now. Um, every point counts. Every point counts. The one thing that also has changed is with the new point system at BSB, it's equal points, isn't it, if I'm not mistaken, between first, second, second, third. I can't remember how far it goes back. But I think, yeah, they're like two points different. Yeah, there isn't like right. a five point, three point, one point yeah. gap. So, so some people are saying that's not the as good. The gaps are definitely smaller. Yeah, because before it would be five points between first and second. Still an advantage. Exactly. And what will be interesting with that is you might see, you will see the consistent, sensible riders banking a load of points. Because if you're third and go for second and you're moving up together as as a duo moving through, it's the same amount of points between first and second and second and third. So you might be able to settle a little bit more for a third or a second or a fourth or whatever it might be on the day. If you're running a proper championship season, there are times when you will sit back and go, well, I'm only losing two points. I'm not losing five. I think it promotes racecraft and it promotes a lot of thinking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially when you have the the points change for Alton and Donington, then it changes again for Brands. It does. You have to be, you have to be on the, you have to have a little um, sticky tape list on your tank top. Yes. So you know where you can... (laughs) You know what points are which at the yeah, end of yeah. those last three points. I also think as well in the main season, when is it 15 points for a win, I think, Dave, in the main season? Because it goes up to 20, or is it 20? It goes up to 25, doesn't it? It? Tw- it does now. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think, I think it was 22, 20, 18. Oh, it might be 22. Like Sorry, my apologies. I'm just going to confuse something. everyone even No, no, further. it's fine. I, 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 I haven't know it sat got... down and looked at it hard enough yet. Yeah, I know it goes up to 25. So when the showdown starts, which is now two rounds, that's 25. And I know the showdown finale is 35. So basically, with yes. the lower points scored in the main season, what that will also do, I'm just thinking about this now, any crash or mistake is going to be penalised even more because it will be a lower scoring system for the first few rounds. If you do throw it down the road, that gap's going to be eaten up even quicker isn't it? Even if you've won a few races, yeah. because the points gaps are smaller and it will compress the... F- I'm getting excited just thinking about it now. It's going to compress the field even more. <laughs> and then with 35 points available for a win at Brands Hatch, you might get someone coming into their fifth in the championship, ending up as the champion or, or going the other it's way. It's exactly what they want to happen. Which and is that, exactly what they want. Brilliant. I think it, yeah. it's, a, it's a much... I think it's a better... The, the, the showdown had served yeah. its time, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. It had yeah. served its purpose. It was yeah. great while it lasted, and it was time with all the manufacturers and the teams yeah. a little more equal in terms yes. of performance. It's now the time to start stepping away from it, and I think Stuart's made absolutely and his team have made absolutely yeah. the right. And as Stuart said to you in your recent podcast with him, um, thank you. Okay, there's, pe- <laughs> there's people who <laughs> there's, there's, uh, at least he's got over, it, hasn't he? Um. There's people who will like it. There's people who won't like it. And the same with the showdown. But as, as we said before, there's always going to be somebody who doesn't like something. It's going to be good. It's nice. That what's good about BSB in that sense is it, it is different. And you need to be a bit yes. different. You know, who wants to be the same as everyone else? It's going to be good. They so just, let's see. Let's and maybe see. in a couple of three years, the, the step will be made back to a, a mm. straight championship like most maybe. GP World Superbikes. Maybe. But maybe. It doesn't matter because it's still going to be great racing and... I, I'm I'm looking forward to and those other two have changed anyway and, and yeah, there's three races okay. a weekend in World Superbike now as well. Remember, yeah. so that's changing. And MotoGP's got sprint races, so they're changing too. It's happening all the time. We've got a massive year of racing in 2023. I'm so excited. Yes, we have. It's still only and, and a new, fresh look on the podcast and all there's all sorts going on. Mate. I'm so excited for next year. <laughs> yeah, Maybe no, becoming too. 50 isn't going to be too bad. Oh, yeah, we'll make sure we celebrate. Can I just say now, everyone, can you bombard Dave Neal with tweets and Facebook messages and Instagram messages and all the rest of it for his 50th and birthday? And Telegram. And Telegram now. Or even old snail mail. <laughs> I can give you his address. Um, no, I better not do that for security well, reasons. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, Gregory Haynes has slept there. <laughs> Which isn't yeah. my bed, by the way. This is our spare room. <laughs> I would By the way, the side just, of that wall, but just Haynes before has, we has... sign off, and I don't mind going on and, and dragging this out because I know people have got more time over the winter to listen to things like this. 
on the bed there, my bed. <laughs> Can't um, see. Is there not an yeah. item? If you just move to your left, <laughs> shove off. Come on. <laughs> Oh, I don't know which side you're on when this goes out. Shove off. We'll... No, yeah, you're right. I, I, I have moved to my left, yeah. What, what's that? This is Double Red's annual for the 2022 Bennett's British Superbike season. It is and seeing who, red. And who's in the middle of it on that page you showed me before we start? Oh, he's put it down. Before we start Bradley recording. Bradley Ray. No. Further. Bradley into... Ray. Yeah. The Bennett's British Superbike Champion of 2022. But look at this, viewers. If we just fabulous images pages, by Double Red, they are fabulous available images. from www.britishsuperbikebook.co.uk. There we are. I'm sure um, James and Sue and Barney will be delighted. They're paying you for this, aren't they? No, they're not. Well, I'm not going to mess around Absolutely with James Wright. He's at, James Wright is a black belt in karate, so I should probably stop making Hong Kong Fuji. Yeah. Now, look at this. Have you found... Yeah, there he is. The fame-craving David Neal. There you are. That's it. Um, That's a beautiful yeah. picture. I know for those that are listening move on audio... Move over, move over. This, oh, this, yeah, is a this, is, this is a difficult one for those listening on audio, but I'm holding up a picture of Brad Ray doing a burnout on the finish line at Brands Hatch um, as he crossed the line in... Um, in October. There you go. That's the picture. And for those of you who were watching with video and saw me shaking my head there, I'm not shaking my head at Brad Ray. What I'm shaking my head at is that. And for those listening in on audio, we can see Dave Neal's smiling face on the left taking a picture of Brad Ray. So he's delighted. I'm surprised you've not signed that book, Dave, and tried to flog it on eBay. <laughs> in, in the course of doing my job, Greg, that was me doing my job of getting yes. content for the race team of Bradley Ray doing a burnout and the reel was quite popular as well. So I, I, it was just me in the course of doing my job last season. It, it was. Not next and season. Again, this for is those my you, job now. Those of you listening on audio only, he just gave me a look that if looks could kill, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the bed, this is the bed where Greg used to sleep when he was invited. <laughs> There we go. Oh, what a way to what a way to finish. Yeah, I tell Gregory you what, Haynes, thank you, you realize, so much, mate. Uh, you do realize nobody's listening anymore, don't you? Yeah, thank you, and I'd also yeah, would awful. like to say <laughs> uh, thanks to you, Dave, and again, thank you very much to everybody for joining us on Eurosport across the season, and then for those of you who've been reading Motorcycle News, we really appreciate it, and we hope to see you again uh, somewhere, someplace, I guess, in 2023. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Greg, and have a great Christmas, mate. We'll catch you next year. Yeah, Merry Christmas, David. <laughs>